the tickets, um, I'm giving a workshop in May as part of the, the Build Right Maker Series up in Dayton. And so tonight, the people at Sparkbox, who are the sponsors of that, have uh, said that I can give away a live streaming access to the workshop. Uh, so you'll hear more about what it's about, but hopefully everybody has their uh, ticket and uh, the, the ticket masters. Th there's only one ticket in here, so we know who's going to win. Uh, did you need this to? OK. <laughs> That's it. All right. Well, let me, let me kick it off by uh, telling a story, kind of an unexpected iterative story of what brought me here tonight. Uh, I started hanging out with user enjoyment. When did it start? Where's Mr. Mark? 2013. 13. Uh, the only person knew about UX at the time. Well, I, I was. Uh, stunned when I started meeting the user enjoyment crowd and realized how few people in this group had actually ever met their customers and their users. Lots of people knew their clients, but no real direct contact with the people who were using the things that they were making. Uh, so I thought, well, how can I help out? And I did a, a presentation where I took four uh, user experience techniques, the least invasive techniques uh, that I thought people could kind of embrace and feel empowered to go out and use. And uh, I, I think people liked it. Some, some people were here who were there. Um, one of the people in the audience was a client of ours who said, oh, you got to do that inside our company. So we're like, yeah, sure, we can do that. Gave that talk. And then a couple of months later, I realized, We'd exposed people, but nobody was using it. Because um, just being exposed wasn't enough. So we kind of uh, grew this in, grew it. It was a half day workshop, and then it became a whole day workshop. And we embedded actually going and using the things with real customers, with intact teams. And it, it kind of evolved into this thing. So now we've done this workshop, uh, US, Canada, variety of clients. And Sparkbox said, well, have you ever thought of opening it up as a open workshop? So it's, it's evolving again. Uh, you guys were the original guinea pigs, and it grew into something. From doing the workshop, I learned that there's two recurring questions. They happen over and over again. So not everybody who does these inside companies wants to be there. Uh, so they're like, why? Why do I have to talk to customers? What could possibly benefit me to do this thing that my boss told me I have to go and do your workshop. Uh, the other one is, hey, great, now I have these tools. Where's the opportunity to use them? So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. You guys are the guinea pigs again. This is the first time I've given this talk about why you should all be talking with customers and users. And where are these opportunities? Where are the places I could use them? All right. What, uh, you know, what I can tell you, and it won't change Mark's behavior whatsoever is uh, interrupt me, stop me. If there's things that you want to ask, if there's things that you don't understand, don't wait, don't wait to the end, seriously, because we, uh, we can thrash it out right now. And there was someone named Kevin who I was writing back and forth with. Is he here? Kevin, I know you've got questions. You've told me you've got questions, so ask questions. Cool? All right. So uh, simple. Every single person in this room, I don't care what your role is, where you work, developer, designer, product person, if you have any decision-making capabilities in the thing that you do about designing something that someone's going to use, you should be talking to real customers and real users. And you can do this, right? We're going to get into a little bit of the limitations that you may see in the way, or we're going to knock them down. OK. So I kind of covered this. Today's talk is really all about the why and the what. Covered that. All right, so what am I specifically talking about? And th this, is, this is where it starts to sound a little crazy. 
This is not about, hey, I want to talk to somebody who can tell me about users. This isn't, I want to talk to somebody who can tell me what the requirements are. This is going and getting your own insights from watching real people doing real things in the real world, as close to their real tasks and their real jobs as you can get. Um, it's, it's not always uh, possible, but think of it as you want to approximate uh, getting to that end reality as best as you can. So why am I stressing real customers and real users? Um, if you think about it, there is some thing out there that you don't know. There is a truth. It's obscured. The farther you are away from that, the less you're going to be able to accurately make the thing that matches that truth, right? So when people are making appointments at a dentist's office, what are they thinking about? What are the factors that matter to them as they're making the choice of which dentist to go to? What is important to them about scheduling? If you don't know that, you're guessing. So product managers will tell you what you're supposed to put into the product. If they haven't talked to customers and users, they're guessing. Your clients, they're paying you to build something, may or may not care about the user's point of view. They're like, you know, knock, knock. It's just about scheduling. So if you go down the list, there's a bunch of people who get between you and the end user. You can ask your family, you can ask people on the street, people you work with. You may just decide on your own, right? None of those people are your customer. None of those people are your users. All right, so very important. It's got to be real people who represent um, themselves. Okay, so if you do this, if you listen to me and you go out, what are you looking for? What is it that you could learn from this kind of exposure? It, it's going to give you insights. And uh, I'm stressing that, and you'll see I make some, some distinctions later. But it's finding things. You, you come into your observation with things you already know. You'll see something happen. And then there's this magic that happens as you take this new piece of information and the stuff you knew before, and you put it together, and a light bulb goes off. That's an insight that only you can bring to the situation, and it's only provided to you because you have this new thing that you saw. Right? It's um, something that the people who are telling you to build the product may not know. It's something that you don't know. It could be something that the people you're watching don't know. So it's not as simple as going up to user and saying, what do you want? What do you care about when you're making a dental appointment? It's more about you making a connection that nobody else sees. And I've got two, two stories about this. We did an uh, observational project. We were going into an, an, uh, an office. It's like a dental office or an architect's office or any office that's a professional service. And we get into this situation for a very specific purpose. We wanted to see how the people in those offices were using the tools of our client. Right? They, they wanted to know, we built these things for a purpose. Are they actually using them that way? So that was why we went there. But we brought a team. Right? It's not just people like myself. It's not user experience people. It's not solely user researchers. Right? We had product people there, we brought developers, we brought testers. And the idea was they'll have different views on things. And the, the office was very nice. They opened themselves up and said, yeah, just follow people around and watch them do their jobs. And one of the developers talked to the user researcher and said, you got to meet this person over here. And there was a worker in that office who had a very unique job and had absolutely no digital tools. Her job was central to the functioning of this business. Everybody in the group relied on her, and she had a closet with binders of paper. And people would come and ask her a question, and she would go to her binders, and she'd open up the binders, and she'd give them the answer. And the system worked for them. Everybody else in the office had modern tools except for her. So the team looked at that and said, 
ooh, there's an opportunity. The customer is not saying there's a problem. The business people who serve them did not say there's an opportunity. The team saw something that had never been seen until they contacted real people. And with that, they started saying, what tools can we do? What money can we make? And then came the data collection. Then came the validation that it wasn't just in this one unique office. Every one of their clients had some similar role, this antiquated role that nobody ever recognized. That's what I mean by insights. Another story, we had a client who they were a paid search uh, product. Basically, they had a unique set of information. They want to get people to subscribe. Once you're subscribed, you pay based on the interactions that you do as you're using their tool. But they noticed that their um, monthly charges were going down and down and down. Their revenue was just kind of tanking. And they asked everybody, are you still happy with our tool? And they're like, yep, fantastic. Sign us up for another year. Why are you using it less? I'm not using it less. Yes, I use it every day, every day. So then they called us in. And at first, we did these remote sessions where we had people all over the world who used this tool just dial in. And we said, hey, we'd just love to see you use the tool. So tell us when you're going to do it. We'll have a bunch of people watching. And what we found was the tool itself had a search capability before you found what you wanted, and then you got to the information. Well, their search tool sucked. It was really bad. And people figured this out. They figured that they could go to Google, do a search to narrow down their topic, understand what they were searching for, then go to the paid tool and go directly to the thing that they wanted, retrieve it, and use it. So all the money that the company was making on the sloppy search tool, they never had to fix it because nobody ever complained. They just bypassed them. They went right around them. So we brought that insight back and said, maybe you're charging them for the wrong thing. Instead of charging them for the searching, charge them for the finding, right? Because that's what they're really doing. They're working around your tool because it costs too much to search in a sucky search tool. So everybody get what insights are, right? It's, it's kind of this intangible that just happens when you watch real users. All right, data versus insights. Um, I don't want you guys to feel like you've got to go out and become a user researcher who's collecting data, who's making points, who sees 100 people, who then says, you know, we've got trends and here's our graph and I'm going to prove it to you and things like that. Insights, right? It's all about bringing that insight. There'll be someone, or maybe there's even no need to validate your insights with data later. Uh, you should be focusing on the, the things that matter to you in your job to help you make decisions or help your company make a design decision. You do not need to follow the full path and become a, a full-blown user researcher. Let the experts do the data, right? Um, here's another story. We had a client, and, and this will kill you, because as I tell you the story, you're going to go, ah, anyone could have seen this. The tool was for a highly transactional job. Uh, I am the user in, uh, of this particular tool. It has hundreds of variations of uh, transactions that I could perform on behalf of my business. The transactions come to me in my job from my management, right? They'll give me an allocation of, here's a bunch of transactions to do. The tool itself on an automatic schedule will push transactions to me that I have to do covering you know, thousands of potential uh, people and, and their accounts here. Individual coworkers, you know, you and I work together, you are fielding something, you want to send it to me, you can send it to me. So some of these people actually sit at a desk where the public could come up and bring them unknown transactions. So given that situation, the people who built the tool said, well, we don't know moment to moment which way this person has to go. We're going to make it so they kind of sit in the middle and they have the capability to go to any transaction they want. Well, that's all fine and good. But we went down and did an observation. And now observation, I mean not asking the people any questions. 
we're just watching, right? There's two of us, we're going to this office, we're following people around, we just watch them do their job. And the person who was doing this with me, I said, did your person defer a lot? You know, like see something come in and go, I'm not doing that now. It's like, oh yeah. So the next day we asked them, right now we can start interfering a little bit more. We can say, why are you deferring so many? And they said, well, we're bucketing them. We know that there's going to be five to 700 delinquent bills a week. So instead of taking them as individual transactions, we put them in the system assigned to ourselves for Friday morning or Thursday or whatever bucket these things need to go on. So they're still doing this with all their other transactions, but then they bucket all these other ones. And I said, well, then what do you do? Oh, then I spend three or four hours on a Friday morning going delinquent bill, person, send a letter, delinquent bill, person, send a letter, because the system was set up to deal with individual transactions. There was no batch processing. So, yeah, we went back to the people who work in this company and we said, do you think your clients would like to turn a three, four hour task into a five minute task? That's the kind of stuff. Those are the things that are out there if you are just watching and listening to users. The continuum. I'm gonna talk about this a lot. So as I refer to it, this is just my kind of case study, right? And for example, there's a continuum about knowledge about customers and users, right? It can be a broad spectrum. I'm just gonna pick some spots on that line. You can guess. How many of you guys in your jobs now have to make decisions where you're guessing about your customers and users? I see nods, I see hands, I see it's most of your lives, right? Um, somewhere out there is that truth I was talking about. It's this almost inaccessible truth, and you don't even know where it is. So you may have had enough experience guessing, gotten enough feedback that you're pretty good and that puts you a step ahead of somebody who's just absolutely guessing. If you wanted to, you can go out and get insights. That makes you even better. It feeds your experience, and it puts guessing in a distant past. It's something you'd rather not do anymore. Uh, if you have data, data beats insights, right? Data can be used to find insights, but if your insight is wrong, you saw one person, and the data goes, that's just one person. Right? It, it, it overpowers it. But somewhere on this continuum, there's lots of little steps in, in between. I'm trying to encourage you guys to start moving up the continuum. Now, when you're making a decision, you're gonna reach a comfort level. Maybe it's your comfort level, maybe it's the company's com comfort level. There's something that says, we need a little bit more confidence before we roll this thing out. So it could be right there that we're gonna work on something that none of us have ever done and we're all gonna be guessing, all right? So we have a client who's come up and they do finite element analysis. Anybody in here know about finite element analysis? Well, too bad, we have a client, right? We're gonna build them a tool that helps them with finite element analysis. And which one of you is gonna design the interface? Who's gonna decide what components and features to put forward? All right, so we got to move it up a little. We need someone with some experience on the team with finite element analysis, so we're going to go find somebody who's used these products, have them join the team. Now, you can move up the continuum, but at some point, you don't need more information. You need enough information to get you to whatever your goals are at that time. Now, it's your goals, the business imperatives of your client, it's some fluid point in there that isn't quite guessing and isn't putting so much effort into this that you're paralyzed with analysis trying to find a truth that you're never gonna know. That space in between, I think of that as the benefit bar. Every time you consider a continuum, you're gonna have some point along that benefit bar. It's a cost-benefit analysis, right? And you're gonna feel it or you're gonna discuss it as a group how confident are we that we're, we should go ahead with this thing? A lot of times you don't have a choice. You maybe not even get to the benefit bar, but there's a caution. It's, it's uh, don't go too far 
and, and don't do too little. So uh, this holds for all sorts of things. Tolerance for risk. It could be your company profile, your personal profile. There's some benefit bar that slides up and down the continuum between too little, too much. Minimum viable product. I hate that term. It makes it sound like there is one point for a minimum viable product. What is it? It depends. It depends on your goals. It depends on your market. It depends on how much your VC funders are willing to put forward, right? All sorts of factors. But it's a conscious thing, this continuum. All right. So uh, before we get to why, trust me, have I convinced you all? No, oh, you're suckers, right? <laughs> So this guy gets up and says, you should do these crazy things, and you should change what you do, and, and here's all the, the good stuff. Here's why. Because this is basically all I've done for 30 years, right? For 30 years, I worked at a bunch of different companies getting the information from customers and users into the mindsets of the people who need to make the decisions. Uh, done it in a variety of different ways. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you how many people, I used to do this thing where I would uh, ask people in the audience different products that they've used, different things, to see if there wasn't somebody in the room who wasn't touched by some decision that I or my team made. When you work on enough products, the things you do spread out over millions of people, right? And so that behooves you even more to be making decisions because you're impacting the lives of people. And you, you may say it's just a dentist's appointment, right? But think of how many people are frustrated by something that you built. And, and getting that insight to get closer would be so much better. And, and so in this history of doing this, the easiest ways, the best ways, some of the coolest solutions have been when I've convinced people who weren't user experience people to go out with the user experience people and touch customer knowledge. All right, so now I'm going to go into the, the values to you. You guys have any questions like the framework of what I'm going to ask you to do? No? Okay. Mark's, he's like, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Let's do it. All right, so it gives you a voice. If you are personally going out and bringing insights back, you become the guy who gets to sit at the table with the adults. Right now, I don't know you individually, but I'll bet that a bunch of you are disenfranchised from decision making. Someone is telling you, go build this thing. Somebody is deciding, and they may have no more insight than you. They may not even know what they're talking about. They may have no customer or user contact, and yet, you don't have a voice. You don't have a way to say, but wait, we're going down the wrong path. Once you have insights, you have ammunition to have that voice. You can say, I know that's what they're asking for, but I saw this guy, and here's what he did. And that's running counter to what you're telling me to build. And maybe no one will hear you, but maybe somebody will. Maybe somebody will go, oh, Marcy said that, we better go check. Because I don't have that insight, but Marcy's got the insight because she saw real customers and users. So getting these insights, being the person, it gives you power. If you feel powerless in your position to try and influence the direction of a product, this is a great way to get a voice. And again, there's that continuum, right? The more exposure you have, the more insights you bring back, the more valuable you become to your company, the more influence you'll have, and then you can progress in the things that you do, in the things you get done. Better design decision making. Okay. And maybe I'm exaggerating, but I'll bet most of you make dozens, if not hundreds of decisions every day in the job that you're doing. Do I go this way or that way? Does it have to perform this fast or that fast? Is it, is it really the most important feature or should I be doing something else? And a lot of times you have no guidance. When you have the insights, you'll have an internal reflection to go back on. And you'll go, okay, that woman doing the transactional analysis, 
I could start making the batch processing for her or I could work on the feature that was next in the next release that marketing brought to me that said somebody really needed. Which one's more important? Right? You'll have that uh, waiting. Um, you'll also learn what you don't know. Right? By going out and doing the insights, you don't always find what you're looking for. You don't always find surprises. Right? But sometimes you go out and you find that you don't know something. Right? Not knowing something is a super value. Because if you didn't know you didn't know it, you wouldn't work on it. But now that you know that you don't know it, you can start putting some cycles towards that. You can start saying, oh, OK, here's an area where I am at personal risk because I don't know this thing. Let me go find out more about it. Um, oh, yeah. And there's that continuum, again, down on the bottom. Uh, most of the time, if you don't know and you're guessing, you end up designing based on your own experience. Well, this is what I would want. I personally love the, po the color purple. So we're going to make it purple. So let me tell you, with insights, you're going to be freed up from that. You can stop designing for yourself. And then, parenthesis, you really should stop designing for yourself. Right? It's over. Right? The, the, the age of being successful designing for what you like uh, gone. All right, just to close some of the links here. So if you're making better design decisions, is that really going to make better uh, experiences in the end? And there's a clear link here. Uh, if you are ever on a team that has no insight, where you're just totally guessing, and you have the luck to fail and recurse and iterate, Think about how long that takes, right? When you've got that internal set of insights that help guide you, then when you are going your first attempt, you've already leapfrogged all of those failed iterations, all of those ideas where uh, you spent cycles on things that were never going to be the thing. And so it, it does lead to a better experience. It gives you an opportunity to actually succeed, and it kind of shortens your whole uh, experience. And almost everything you work on is going to have some goal. And it's also going to have some technology. And the technology is going to have possibilities and limitations. I don't think that you can work on a product that doesn't have some goals. Now, the goals may not be well formed. They may not be well expressed. But they're there. And the technology, you could flip flop, but the technology is there. By being the person who brings insights, you're in a unique position because there's something that's absolutely not necessary in it. It's necessary to have some goal. It's necessary to have some technology. But that missing glue, the thing that balances all of those, is what you can bring to the table. Right? And that's, that's special because it's not necessary. And that's a differentiator for you as an individual, for the experience you bring at the end, and for your company. I was talking with someone here, tonight, I think it was Cody, right, who was saying, uh, everybody's trying to figure out, how do I get that customer value? How do I get that insight? How do I build it into what I'm doing? How do I convince the clients that they need that? Be the glue. New problems and new ideas. OK. Um, along the lines of finding things you didn't know, you find things that you were absolutely not looking for. And sometimes it's discovering a new problem where no one's telling you there's a problem and it just hits you in the face. You get that insight and the lights go off and you're like, oh my gosh, there's a problem right there no one saw. Sometimes it's opportunities for new features like I mentioned before. But occasionally you can run into something that transforms everything you think. And I'm going to tell you my story of the woman with scissors. Um, after this experience, I never designed products the same way again. Uh, I, you know, it wasn't the next day, but the idea of the woman with the scissors never left me until I said, I got to pivot the whole way I think about things. So I was working on a product. It was an a embedded software, physical product. It was a big back-end banking machine. So these are those uh, honking machines you never see that are cranking out the thousands of checks, 
uh, that, that industrially get printed. And we had a new one, and, and we'd worked on this great interface and an instructional set, and uh, we were testing our one-of-a-kind functional prototype. And the tasks were, you know, set the machine up, put it through its cycle of actually doing some runs, and then we're trying, trying to echo the, uh, the longitudinal life of this machine. So at the one year point, the interface interrupts and says, hey, it's time to change the print head. Okay, so we had the people who were testing it for us change the print head, follow the insert, just go for it. We were watching. And uh, there's this woman who, you know, saw the instruction. She reaches into her purse and pulls out the biggest scissors I have ever seen in my entire life. I mean, you could have sheared sheep with these things. These are not your office scissors. These are like twice as big as your office scissors. And without blinking an eye, she walks up to our prototype and she starts jamming the scissors into the device. And we're like, in shock, right? I'm not thinking about the money, I'm thinking about the electricity that is in this device as she is, you know, jamming it in there. We stop her. And uh, we made sure that she wasn't a lunatic, right? We took the scissors away and we're like, nice little old lady, what are you doing with the scissors, right? Why are you whacking at this thing? And all justification, all calmness, she said, you guys design equipment for men. Nobody I work with can do any maintenance on any of your devices. So we all have something like these scissors. Scissors, pokers, anything that we can get in there and leverage things because we can't grab a print head and pull it off. We're not physically strong enough. And a light bulb went off. The insight was we were all men. We were all engineering things based on what we could do. When we built it, it was like, yeah, take the print head out. Done, new one, pop, done. Prove it, works just fine. That's an insight. That, that, he's laughing in the back, right? You have trouble with print heads? Oh, I won't put you on the spot. Uh, but that's it. Who are you designing for? That woman wasn't just that woman. That woman was every woman who was of her stature, of her strength, who could not do what her job required her to do. She found a workaround because I was too stupid to know that she was a user and design it for her. And then I started thinking, who else am I missing? So that, that transformation of you as an individual can come about from watching real users too. Empathy, right? Um, it humanizes the customer and user to see them struggle. It's painful sometimes to see that people are not uh, having an easy time with the things you built. It can change the way you approach the idea. Customers, they're money machines. We don't care about anything about them, what they do, except for buying our product. We want to convert them so they buy more things they don't care about. That's our whole goal, isn't it? They don't have lives outside of their purchasing behavior. They don't have motivations. They don't have life traumas. They don't have ways that they would prefer to do things. I don't really care about that as long as they buy. Right? Users, I would just wish they would press the button like I want them to, because it's really simple. It's right there. How stupid are they? All that changes as you start having more and more experiences with real people and real uh, situations. Um, you start caring, and you start doing things differently because you care. That empathy, it's an intangible benefit of being someone who goes and sees insights. You gotta be some heartless guy to go out, experience real customers and users, have insights, and then not care. Uh, oh, and by the way, see these two little red dashes? That's my wife's edits of my deck, which I uh, forgot to turn black. She, she corrected a whole bunch on there so it wasn't just uh, in, in unintelligible to you. Uh, she's right in almost every case so that'll be black the next time I give this talk. <laughs> um, so very short story here. The, the, there was a team that I was on who did what's called adopt a customer. It's a fantastic experience if you ever get an opportunity to implement this where you work 
it's great. Uh, you pick one customer and you assign a team of people to that customer and you pick some transitional moment in their experience. This is the very first time they've ever used the product or this is a time for an upgrade or uh, this is something that's happening and you're there from the very beginning and you send a mixed team. You get uh, people who maybe user experience product people, dev, designers, whoever your mix is and you assign them to that person and you just watch them. You watch them go through their initial experience. You hear the questions and you don't help them. You just kind of internalize, I'm a spy. I'm watching what they would have done if I wasn't here. Then you transition, right? So maybe you do this three or four visits. Then the next visit, you can ask them questions. You're still not helping them. Then three more visits like that. And then it becomes them asking you questions and you can help them and you see what a difference that makes. And then you can test out ideas with them. And you build this year-long relationship where after you stop visiting them, you're the on-call customer support person. This person has any problem, they bypass customer support and they come right to you. You're their personal dog and pony, right? They pull a string, you do a trick. But in that process, you learn in depth more than any single visit's gonna teach you to any user. Um, we did this, and, I, and I, I think it was Cody again, we were talking. We did this with a blind guy. We gave him a brand new computer. We watched him set it up, install software, uh, download things he wanted, use the internet. I mean, there is nothing more uh, insightful than seeing your product be totally un inaccessible to, to someone who can't use it. But that, this would go for anybody, right? It doesn't have to be a blind person. Empathy you feel. Right up there with empathy is the ego slap, right? So, I mean, how many people here think that they're a pretty good designer or a developer? Come on, yeah, right? Who thinks they're hot shit, right? Yeah, right. Who thinks they're untouchable? Who thinks they're better than anybody else in the room? Yes, go, go. Um, you obviously are either really good or you've never seen anybody use your products, right? It is. It is humbling. It is painful. You come away limping uh, when you see someone struggle with something that you built. Uh, I, I don't, I, I'll tell you about Alan in a minute, but um, I did a really nasty thing one time. We had an engineer who really thought he was top dog and dominant, and he was going to push his ideas forward no matter what. And his father was in our subject pool. So I had his father come in as a subject and use a tool that his son had built without the father knowing. And on tape, he goes, who built this thing? That kid changed in a moment, right? So, so that's the ego slap, right? Sometimes you just need to be slapped around a little. You need to be poked. You need someone to say you're not as good as you think you are. You're overconfident. Pay attention. This is that um, continuum between, hey, I'm doing a great job, and you don't want to overdo, right? Because if you start thinking that you're no good, then you're just going to start drinking and sitting in a corner, and you're not going to code anymore. Right? Not good either. So I'm just, you know, just see how much you can tolerate. But really, go out and, and get a little reality testing. So Alan, the customer, uh, I had built a product, my team and I had built a product, and we had done everything that we thought within our budget was right. We studied the user, we understood the model of the workflow that they had, we saw their needs, we saw that the tools that they had didn't do it, we built something for them. We hit the mark. We released this thing, and all the feedback we got from the people that were using our tool was thumbs up, you guys did it. Little tweak here, there, life is fine. But then the CEO, comes to me and says, you're getting on a plane to England. And I'm like, well, why am I doing that? Well, there's this guy, Alan, who works in one of our clients, and one of our big clients, you know, 400 offices around the world who just implemented our tool. And Alan told his CEO that we are ruining their company. And so when the CEO called the CEO and that CEO came to me, it was not, would you, 
think about going to the UK. It wasn't when it's convenient for you, could you go to the UK? It was, if you value your job, you'll go talk to Alan. And I came armed. I'm like, I've got all the data on what we did right. I've got all the data on how everybody loves what we're doing. And I get there and I start talking with Alan and I realized Alan was right. We had not anticipated that the process, the business process of this and other client companies, it had to have existed before we introduced our tool. But I didn't think of it as a system. I saw individuals who needed something and we gave it to them. By doing that, we ruined what Alan's team used to do for those people. And not ruin like take work away. Now there were way more people in 400 offices asking Alan's team for help. Alan had to hire three additional people to handle the grief that we had introduced by empowering other people in the system. Does that make sense? We didn't think of the whole system. I came back from there a much shorter human being than when I went out. I felt like the weight of the world had pounded on my head, but we fixed it, right? So it's well worth going out. Uh, another value of getting insights. It's a means to validate or to contradict the plan of record, all right? Uh, we're gonna do a photo app and everybody wants to take three pictures at a time. I don't know why, it's there, we start building it. You have an insight that goes, no. People usually take one picture at a time. We can put that capability in, but that shouldn't be the default. Or you go out and you say, yep, in the context of what we're doing, people want to have that you know, mini animation of three pictures at a time, you're right. Those insights, aside from data, will help quiet some of the second thoughts you have about what you're doing, or they're gonna give you the confidence to go ahead. This is a really valuable thing because how many times do you rethink things, right? And you don't have time to go out and, and get super deep data to validate things. But if you could just like make it through the night without waking up at three o'clock in the morning thinking, did I make the right choice? That's a huge value to you, right? And, and that's what insights will help you do. And this is my absolute favorite. Um, it shortens the conversations. So if nobody goes out to meet with customers and users, then we're gonna spend a lot of time meshing our opinions and a lot of political effort to see who's right, who's wrong with no information. If I go out and I see the users, I'm gonna come back and then you're all gonna sit in your jobs and try and fight against the information that I bring forward, or argue that I haven't gotten enough, or whatever reason you have. But if we all go out, and we all see something, and we debrief, and we share in those experiences, all that conversation, all that wasted time, we're aligned. We're working off of the same basis of information, and we're ready to proceed as a team like we hadn't been before. So, if you're in a model now where the user experience person goes off, or the product manager, or the business analyst goes off and brings information, you're doing better than a lot of companies, but you're not doing as well as you could if you all had those experiences. Okay, so these are the eight values that I wanted to put up. These are the whys. I mean, I'm sure there's more. These are the ones that, that I value. Before I go on to the next, any question about the why? No questions at all. All right. So, now you're, you're feeling like, okay, I, I want to try this. Wait, I ah, have, excellent. I have another idea. What is the difference between your insights and usability testing? So, it depends what you mean by usability testing. Her question was, what's the difference between insights and usability testing? So you can get insights from watching usability studies, absolutely. Um, there's a whole continuum of what a usability study is. There's very formal usability studies where you're trying to actually be predictive. Um, if I was working on a medical device and I wanted to make sure that physicians could use it 
effectively without harming patients, I would want to do usability studies in the extreme because I can't afford to be wrong. I need data. I need bulletproof predictability, right? But in reality, most products don't need that much from a usability study. So there's degrees. And then at some point, it becomes an informal study where you're not even applying statistics. It's about the discovery of errors. And even that I can count. I can say I had 30 representative people in a usability study, and they had uh, seven tasks to do. On average, people failed two out of seven times. How did they fail? I can categorize it. I can apply that information forward. Then there's even less formal usability studies where you're not even counting. You're just going for impressions. Uh, do you know about the right methodology, R-I-T-E? It's, it's the agile equivalent of usability studies. You run one person. You see the problems that they have. In the back room, you're deving a new solution. Number two sees a different interface than number one did. Did they have the same problem? Yes or no? Yes, we haven't solved it. Do it again. And then you just try and steer through all the possible error space. So that's, that's the continuum of usability studies. Insights don't necessarily have to have usability studies. It's a, an orthogonal process. You've got uses, usability uh, continuum here. You can gather insights from watching any one of the people in there. You can use a usability study to validate your insights. Um, you go off and you see the woman with the scissors. That's one woman with one pair of scissors. Before I redesign a whole product line, I'd want to make sure that more than one woman has this problem. Great. Let's get 30 women in to try and take that print head out. Do they bring their scissors? So they, they meld together. They're not, they're not opposites, but um, it's, it's important to know that if you don't know how to, use, how to do a usability study anywhere along that spectrum, if you don't have the empirical background, you can still watch one, and you can still bring insights out of it. Did that? Yeah? OK, cool. Really? Because Is there anybody who, no, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I bring my client, who is a big major corporation, their particular internal needs, but everything's off the guesswork. Yes. They don't do what you're suggesting here. Yes. So I've always thought, well, what if we do a usability test to see how they do it? But that even, like, is not as a no-go because people don't have time. So, so that would be a brilliant thing if you could actually convince the client to let you do that, right? Um, but. I mean, I don't know your client, but I would guess that the people who are bringing you those client requirements, they may not have a real representation of real customers and users, even if they are their own internal employees. And this is worldwide. It's yeah. not even like just Cincinnati. Yeah. So, so if you can't convince them of that, can you convince them to let you go watch one of their employees actually use the tool? It's not a usability study. You're just going to watch. You just want to get some feedback. You can bring back insights. You can leverage them with the power of the things that you learn to convince them that they need to do more. They need to move up that continuum. And I was only kidding. I'll guarantee you that most of us work on things that there's no usability test at all. It's, it's, people don't want to pay for it. People would rather take the risks. And how many companies fail out of every company that starts? Yeah. Um, there was a great uh, accidental discovery. There's an online magazine called, uh, oh my gosh, UX Mag. And they are constantly putting articles out recommending this company has good UX practices. These guys are good. These guys don't follow good practices, so on and so forth. So finally, someone said to them, you guys are so smart, put your money where your mouth is. So these two guys, the two, I don't know, editors or founders, or whatever, they took $50,000 of their own money, and they only invested in companies that followed good UX practices. And this was when the economy was taking a big tank. They made 37% uh, increase on their portfolio. 
Right. So there's something to it. All right. More? Okay. All right. So now you got to think, well, how can I use this? Usability studies is one of them, but it's not going to be the first one. Uh, let me stress. You do not need to be a user researcher to, to get insights. You don't need to go out and understand statistics. You don't need to go out and understand the proper design of a usability study. You just need to go watch them. All right? Now, uh, there's that continuum again. Today, there are things that you can do. You can go and get some training so that there are things that are within your reach without having to become something other than the job you have now. If you want to transition, if you want to say, hey, this is my thing, I want to actually become a user experience person, you can do it through apprenticeship. You can start finding opportunities in your job or through volunteering or through finding a new job where you get to do the things that you don't do today and have someone who's a good coach and mentor show you how to do it. You can go and get a degree. You can work all the way up to being a user research subject matter expert, but you don't have to. The things that I'm talking about in this list that's coming up are things that were in your reach. Don't change your day job and just go out and, and train a little to practice these activities. Field observation. Uh, in many of the stories I've told you, this is your opportunity to go out in the field with the people who go out in the field or on your own. And it's really you today, you can just go. You can observe, you don't interfere, you let them run their protocol. When there's a debriefing, you say, I saw this, right? Or is this what you saw? What did you learn? And you start melding into the mindset by being part of the debrief. And if possible, after, so when user research go out, they structure very carefully what they do not to interfere with what's going on. There's a protocol. When that protocol is done, you can interfere all you want, right? You're not gonna mess up. The big fear that stops a lot of management from letting you guys actually go talk to users is that you're gonna say something stupid. You're gonna go, oh, that's easy to build. We could do that in a week. And then the management goes, you just committed us to build something we are not going to do. Right? How much damage could you guys really do? I think there's a fear uh, of, of how much damage you could really. Who has ever screwed it up so bad with a customer that you got fired? Okay, who has wanted to screw it up so much? Okay, different, different question. Um, with a little bit of training you can do some of the least invasive things, which are really little more than getting people talking and facilitating their talking so that so more information flows to you. Again, uh, the, the things, the, the four things that I picked for, for user enjoyment three years ago are active observation, inquiry for clarity, something called the talk aloud protocol, and descriptive storytelling. And all you do, all you do, is shape people to do what they do and tell you about it. And from that, you're standing out compared to someone who never talks with a customer or user. Uh, another story. How are we doing on time? Do you want me to skip the stories? No? What's that? Two minutes to seven. Two minutes to seven, okay. Um, we had a client in the UK called us in because there were three groups inside their business, all of who had the next set of features for their next release. One was the IT group, one was uh, product development, I think the other one might have been marketing. And they were at a loggerhead. These three lists, not only did they not agree, I don't think that there were any overlaps in this. So they called me and my team in to say, hey, UX people, Come tell us which one of the three of us is right. Well, we came and we said, uh, what are these based on? And there was nothing. None of them had contacted any customers and users. So we put a big red stamp on each one of their lists and said, worthless, worthless, worthless. And we said, we'll get you a new list. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to take one of my people and one of yours and one of yours and one of yours. And that team of four is going to go visit 30 customers. They came back. 
all four of them agreed, all of them built a much shorter list than any one of them had in the original beginning. And those were the things that they gathered from insights. No data, just visiting 30 customers. And they got the insights of what they should actually be building. That's field observation. Very powerful. Usability testing, I'm not going to go into that deeply. We talked a little bit about it. You can observe. You can IM the facilitator who's in the room doing the study while it's ongoing and saying, have them do this, or have them do that again. Or here's a question I would like to have answered. And there's a distinction here. Uh, you know what you need to make decisions. You should be giving that information to the people who are doing usability studies. You're not giving them questions to ask. Their job is to translate those questions into things that can be asked without leading, without bias, without influencing the answer you get back. Uh, Andrea and I know people who were put in the position of running usability tests who were previously the client people, if that makes any sense. They worked for the client, now they're a UX person, and they're interviewing people like them. And they would say things like, isn't that a great design? <laughs> it meets my needs. I'm sure it'll meet yours. Go ahead, use it. And then no matter what they do, they report back. They loved it, right? So there's all sorts of things that um, you could be biased without even knowing. That's an extreme case. All right, let me go on. Interviews, same story. There are interviews going on all the time. There's people in your company who are reaching out to clients, to customers, to users. You need to tap into that. You need to see the interviews or you need to be able to see recordings of those interviews to see what were people really saying. Not how it was summarized, not how it was reported back, but let me get my own insights from what's going on there. Quick question on interviews. Yes. Where do you put that? How do you record it? Oh my gosh. There's all sorts of ways. I mean, if you want to be a real extremist, we used to take all of our recordings of every interview and then have the transcripts done. The transcripts then accumulated into a database where we could do keyword searching over the things that people said. That's, that's kind of way out there. Uh, what if I wanted to just quickly know the two most important things from 1,000 interviews? So, so uh, you're not going to sit through 1,000 interviews, what right? Every month you do a thousand interviews. I'm saying wow. Customer interactions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are you recording that at all? In my brain. No. <laughs> not not good enough, right? You need to put that into a consumable method. Do you take any notes when you do this? Do you have a protocol that you're looking for and saying this person mentioned these things so that I start saying now I see thirty, now I see forty. Yeah, so, so you need to systematize what you're doing because if it's in your head and your head alone, does anybody watch these interactions with you? I'm just, everyone in our company has these interactions. All together? Separately. Separately. What do you do to debrief each other? How do you... We don't because I don't have an answer to my question. Okay, okay. So yes, th I mean... Let's go on the continuum, right? You're, you're not going to get the transcripts for all of these things and do some very systematic analysis. But you're out here in the too little category. You, you know, tomorrow, you say, hey, let's take a lunch on Thursday, and everybody shares all the interactions that they've had. Did you ever have someone do this? Right? That's very casual, but that's, that's a sharing. Right. Or you could start taking notes. Or you could say, I see a pattern. I see 1,000 of these a month, so 250 a week. I must perceive a pattern. Let me list the patterns I think I see, and I'm just going to tick mark them. And then by the end of the week, you go, oh. So yeah, I'm seeing 40, 50 different things, but three of them dominate, and I never noticed the pattern before. And then you go, do you see a pattern? Here's my checklist. Why don't you tick it, tick it for a week? There's all sorts of ways to aggregate the information that you have to cluster it. Go ahead, ask the question that you did online. Experimental, uh, exploratory data analysis and information architecture would help you not just organize your product, but help you organize the information about your insights. Yes. 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 Go do it. <laughs> you can.
right? I, those things that I said, can you, seriously, can you get people together on lunch on Thursday? No, that's tough. You don't have time? What do you, I mean, does everybody just take a break at lunch? Does everybody eat at their desk? Come on, no over a beer. There's a great, um, I can't mention it. There's a company in Columbus that was having a hard time, their client of ours, a hard time getting their people to talk. And so they started sponsoring this evening where it's just beer, right? Oh, well, hey, everybody came and talked. And then they slowly worked them from just talking about that to talking about things that mattered. And now those, you know, 100 people inside that company have said, we want to do this on a regular basis. You can do this. Kevin, invite me over for a beer, right, with all of the people that you work with, and we'll start tearing apart the insights that they're not sharing. I'm serious. Okay. I like beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm moving on. Uh, customer support. There's people in your company who have contact with people every day. Most of the systems that they work on have listen-in capabilities. If you, yeah, I am so sorry. We're running. If you got to go, go. Marcy, I'll see you again. All right. Uh, Social media. There's probably people in your company whose responsibility it is to monitor social media. It's those in transactions that are going on, communications that are happening. Insights are there. You're missing it. Uh, market research. Either you or someone you pay is going out and talking to customers on your behalf. Don't just consume their reports and their analysis and their answers. Go and watch a focus group. Ask them to record it. Share it. Look at it over lunch. Draw your own conclusions. Sales visits, my God, if someone lets you go on a sales visit, you could not only learn a lot, you could become a hero. Because who built the product? Who designed the product? Not the salesperson. And when they get in a bind and the person is asking them a question, you can step forward and say, uh, I know the answer. I built that. This is what it can do. This is how you can use it. So not only can you potentially bring insights back, you can help your company make a sale. Site visits. So more than salespeople visit your customers. If you have a product that needs to be implemented, if it has installers, repair, there's people who maintain the client relationship to make sure that people are happy. These are all touch points that your company has with customers and users that you can tap into. Uh, they are never going to let any of us go to a business review meeting. I put it up there as a, as a pipe dream. Right? Uh, Customer advisory boards. Maybe your company has a board of people that represent your potential customers. They meet on a regular basis. Go, give a demo to those people. Do some training so you can run a chalkboard session with them to extract what their future needs are, right? These are all things within your reach. Brick and mortar, if you make a thing that sells in a store, work the store. Stand on the floor as people come by and look at that thing and ask questions or try it on or play with it. I used to work on a product that was actually quite prevalent in, uh, it was a telephony product. And every time I saw it in, in an office that I visited, I would say, do you like that phone? What do you use that for? How do you do this? And you just start conversations. Product demos, go to conferences. Be the pitch man, stand there, try and explain what you do, and see what people respond to, learning their values. Get some insights. User groups, community groups, discussion boards. All right, what if someone says no? I listed these whole things, you're gonna go tomorrow, and they say, yeah, absolutely not, right? Gorilla you are. You do not have to follow the regular channels. I want you to meet real customers and real users, but maybe they're blocked off for you. So how many people here have friends? Two of you, excellent. Uh, go ask your friends, right? Service providers. You know, this may sound funny, but I keep picking on the dentist's office. Uh, when they see me coming, they have recorded all of the problems that they've had with their electronic health record uh, software since the last time I saw them, and they tell me, right? So every six months, it's like they're working for me, and they're coming and going, six months later, I don't love it anymore and it's a competitor to one of our clients. 
So they're, they're feeding me these insights every time I get my teeth cleaned. Um, your family, I want to caution you, they're going to lie. You know, your grandma loves what you do and, and you make the best products in the world, but you can ask them anyway. But churches, meetups, social, anywhere, right? There's a continuum of people out there just waiting. And if you want to be really sneaky, if your client won't let you talk to their employees, well, there's a bunch of people on LinkedIn who used to work there. Right. Uh, so, sometimes it's not your boss that stops you. I've heard this when we've done the workshop, and, and I get these, right? People say, I can't do this. I'm an introvert. That's why I do what I do. I don't want to talk to people. Well, guess what? Uh, extroverts have a hard time, too. In fact, when we hire extroverts, the warning we give them is, you got to learn to shut up. you got to be less chatty. Because insights are about listening, not about talking. You're just coaching, you're just nudging, but mostly it's what introverts do. They observe, they watch the world. Introversion is not an excuse for not going out. It's your secret power. Permission, right? So I've already told you, if you ask and they say no, keep going, right? Tell them what you want to do, and then if they don't let you do it anyway, you don't have to tell them where you learned these things. You're just going to suddenly appear brighter to them. All right? Time. I know it's a time commitment. I know that you're going to be doing things that you're going to have to trade something off. I know that it's hard to get everybody together for lunch on Thursdays. But you know what? In the long run, it's going to pay off because the whole cycle shrinks when you start getting the insights into the pipeline. Difficult. It's only difficult because you haven't done it before. And, and I have seen this again and again. When I arm twisted people and put them out there, they're like, well, this isn't that hard. Uh, opportunity, it's about making it. Uh, and fear, let me tell you, you have a good reason to fear. You are going to make mistakes. You're going to bring the wrong insights back. You're going to fall on your face. You're going to draw, you know, maybe you're even going to fulfill your boss's greatest fear and you're going to say something stupid. It's okay. Start out now knowing you are going to make mistakes and you will be okay. Where do you go from here? All right, talk to your boss. Tomorrow, go to them and say, I want to interact with real customers and real users. If they say, yeah, brilliant idea, make a plan right then, right there, use some of these things, go out and do it. If they say no, have them call me, right? Because they just need to be convinced. And, and again, I'm serious about being invited out for a beer, I'm serious about this too. I am on a mission. I would love to talk to anybody who needs to be convinced that you guys need to be empowered. All right, invite me to talk. If I have moved you at all along that continuum to thinking this is something you want to do, and this is something you think the other people you work with need to hear, invite me. I'd love to give this talk where you guys work. If you want to learn how, those four techniques, the thing that I've done here that has expanded into a workshop, that's what's happening in May up at the Build Right series. It's, I think I put it up there, it's relatively painless, right? You're going to be doing it among yourselves. I'm bringing some real users in. You get to experiment. You get to take that safety step of not having to do it with somebody who's working on your product. You know, shameless plug, it should be a fun day. Oh, and there's an after party. <laughs> so that after you've gotten through the anxiety, uh, there's alcohol. All right. So uh, if you're interested, we have a raffle ticket. I know that Dayton is sometimes far away. The people at Sparkbox have said that they are opening up live streaming, and I've got a ticket to give away. So who's got the? OK. So, is there somebody who's not interested who would like to pick the name? How about you? I know you're not coming. Yeah, come on. So, uh, truth be told, we, we have another UX expert in the room. Uh, we were counterparts another for old -timer. another, another old-timer. Uh, she does not need to hear my workshop. So, pick somebody out. You need to want me to read it? B T 
271011. Yeah. Are you interested? Yeah. You got a ticket. Congratulations. Thank you, man. That works out. Yeah. See me after. It's up front. So I am sorry that I kept you so long, but uh, I talk too much. I'm one of those people who has to learn to shut up. So thank you guys. Oh, questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Let me do that part. Yeah. Do you, in your experiences, do you expect that the boss is helping facilitate these interactions, or do you have the client, the, the UX, or the other staff go out and do it? So it depends what the interaction is, but mostly it's probably not your boss, okay. right? If it's customer support, the customer support person should be facilitating it. If it's market research, it's the marketing person. If it's a usability test, it's your UX person. Um, your boss should go to these things too, right? Um, where we used to work, I sold the CEO on the idea that four times a month he would have a conversation with a customer where he's not trying to sell them something, where he just calls them up and says, so how's your business doing? What are you doing this quarter? Just to learn more. Your boss a problem? Actually, oh, are we on tape still? Yeah. No, actually, in my case, I am. Oh, you shouldn't go. Yeah, I was kind of offended. Um, but my, and, and I will support everything you said here. So my staff will come to me and say, we want to talk to you. You know, yes. I say, great, go do it. We love it. But there, maybe it's the fear and some of those other elements. But okay. So as the boss, I'm thinking, okay, well, how do I, do I have to do it for them? I don't know no, you it. but you're telling them to go and do it. Have you given them the tools to do it? Have you pointed an opportunity? Have you made the marriage between the customer and the person who works for you. Have you said, hey, look, we have an open door next Wednesday. Take the afternoon off, go sit with the customer and watch them for an afternoon. I could probably do more, but I'm also hoping that if I say, here's an opportunity, they will take that leap on them. Maybe there's not a lot of leapers, yeah. right? There's, there's people who are chomping at the bit to do it, and then there's people who have that list of, I can't, I won't, it'll never, what if I don't? How's my boss going to think if I don't bring, bring back brilliant ideas? So, yeah, it's, you know, taking that first step is hard. Uh, and nobody likes to get slapped. What if they go and they realize that they're not as good as they think they are? They're not as good as him. <laughs> Few of us are. <laughs> but, yeah. No, I mean, seriously, just pick one of them who you think is the most encourageable and help them get to that last inch. Get them over the threshold. But I don't think you need to be there. I, I mean, you obviously don't care if they say something stupid. Um, if they don't have someone to facilitate it and they don't know what they're doing, they will still bring back some kind of information. And they'll feel like, you know, I did that. Yeah, yeah. They, they can do it. Perfect. So we we were doing it for like actual academics. We always we always practice field to make sure that everybody was comfortable with their tools, what the flow and how things were supposed to go. Because things can you can you can have a really great plan all put together and then the second you get out in the field you realize, oh crap, I'm learning stuff I didn't expect. Yeah. How do I refigure this? So practicing gives you a little bit of starts to give you the comments, okay, I, I really do want to do that. Because everybody's going into a, into a social situation that they're not familiar with, even though they think they might be, and yeah. it's really uncomfortable no matter how much of an expert you are. Yeah. Um, so having I mean, that practice really comes in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. And there's the chatty extrovert. When they get uncomfortable, dop it dop it dop it dop it dop it dop it dop right? Um, so what he said they did, that's what my workshop's all about. So send someone to the workshop, right? Um, we do this workshop mostly inside intact companies where they get to practice it and, and learn in a comfortable situation. Then they get to do it with their real customers and real clients. Uh, if that's a big step, send them to the open one. 
It makes a difference. Question, Darren. Uh, Mark. So we've got a new project coming up uh, where the lead, uh, where the agency for a large enterprise, it's an internal application, and it's a full redesign. They've never done any kind of usability testing. They're, they care about UX, but they don't. They have never invested into it before. Um, knowing that they're looking to us for leadership, and we can set the course, um, but we probably, let's say that the leash might be short on providing, you know, mainly thinking about the investment that they would make. If I said, hey, I want to do, you know, usability testing or some usability insight sessions, they're, they're, they're adding up the hours of all the people internally that would be involved. So would you recommend if I have one shot, ideally you have multiple points across, you know, but like, let's say, should, what, should I focus my attention right away before we've built anything on gathering insights? We already have a good, strong idea of what, what we're building, but we, we haven't spoken to the users yet. Right. Should I talk to the users now, or should I save that? And I feel like I need to talk to the users now before I build anything to know that I'm building the right thing. Yes. But. Yes. So, yeah. So, so earlier is always better. If you only have a dollar to spend, spend it early rather than late. Uh, there's the 110, 100 rule. If you spend a dollar in the ideation phase, and this, this is not just, I mean, it used to be a made up rule, but some academic actually went out and looked at the data and found out that it's really almost perfectly on. If you spend a dollar here when it's in the idea phase, you can, you can do a course correct. If you want to do a course correct after you've got it, like we have a plan, we know what we're building, that same course correction will cost you 10 times as much. If you actually build it, it's going to cost you 100 times to fix that same problem. So spend early whatever dollar you have. The other aspect is, and this is something we do with our clients, especially the ones who, who, who don't know what they don't know. We take apart the things that they're asking us to do. Right? These are their goals. And then we say, well, these goals depend upon answering certain questions. Here's a question. Give me an answer to that question. And, and, uh, the enterprise tool, here we go. So it's a financial enterprise tool where people are doing purchasing, right? So you say to them, okay, who in your company, there's a question, who is gonna use this tool? What's the answer? And they name three groups. And then you go, what's your confidence on that answer? How sure are you? Is that based on your speculation? Is that based on anecdotal information? Or do you have data? Right? And you get a thermometer reading off of that. So they have enough of those that are based on speculation. You feed back to them. We got a whole bunch of risk here. Are you willing, can you stomach being wrong? If they say no, that's when you say, then we need to do some upfront user research to get more confident about those answers you gave me or replace the answers. If they're confident, you don't need to spend the money. Because if they're willing to live with making a mistake and they can fund the iterations to be right in the end, or maybe they're right based on their speculations, you're good. Thank you. Yeah. And, and happens all the time. All the time. It's about, it's about making them aware of the risk they're taking because they're totally convinced that it's just build it and, and it'll work right. And we know. <laughs> All right, thank you guys, and thank you for staying so long.